Why the hell do you have to be so critical? I'm a critic. No, your job is to rate movies on a scale from good to excellent. What if I don't like them? That's what good's for. <laughs> oh, God, do I love this show. <clears throat> March is 90s month. Rolls on. And let me get this out of the way. I love The Critic. I love it to death. It's one of my favorite shows. I've seen every episode more times than I can count. I own the DVD set. I can quote it verbatim. But I don't love it because I'm a film critic, though critics do tend to like this show. I mean, it started airing when I was like 15. And no, it didn't make me want to become a film critic. I became a film critic for the same reason everybody does. Gambling debts. Now then, even though it technically originated at the tail end of the 80s, The Simpsons was the television success story of the 90s, a series that no one thought would go anywhere and instead became one of the biggest, if not the biggest, television franchise of all time. Dozens of producers hastily greenlit primetime animated sitcoms of their own, hoping to catch some of the magic, and they all pretty much failed. Spectacularly. Ask me about the fish police sometime. In 1994, Al Jean and Mike Reese, two of the original writers and showrunners for The Simpsons' first four seasons, departed to produce a new series on ABC for Simpsons producer James L. Brooks. That series was The Critic, starring John Lovitz as, well, more or less as John Lovitz, but technically as Jay Sherman, a film critic with his own TV show. Jean and Reese were well aware of the fates that had befallen every other post-Simpsons animated show, and rather than join the ranks of the imitators, worked hard to make sure that the critic wasn't just a different animal than the Simpsons, but also from almost every other sitcom then on the air. Instead of being built around a traditional nuclear family, its main character would be a single divorced man. Instead of being set in the suburbs, it took place in bustling New York City. And instead of being an ordinary working-class show, Jay Sherman was a pretty well-off big city sophisticate in the mold of an early Woody Allen hero, an overeducated cinephile who ran in trendy New York social circles, hung out with movie stars, and frequented upscale Manhattan and restaurants. In other words, Jay was a bit of a snob, and that's where a lot of the humor came from. A middle-aged, professional film dweeb, expert in all things cinematic, forced to make his living handing out pat yay or nay opinions on one craptastic Hollywood blockbuster after another. To get to the part of the show you like the best and I find humiliating, on the shamometer, this film rates an absolute zero. Burr. Gee, that sure sounds like hell on earth. <clears throat> the show also had an unconventional supporting cast. Jay was the Jewish-descended adopted son of a family of old-money New York wasps. His show garnered a surprising level of oversight from his billionaire boss Duke Phillips, a hilarious takeoff on media mogul Ted Turner. He traded verbal barbs with his acerbic makeup lady Doris, shared custody of his young son Marty, and had an actor named Jeremy Hawk for a best friend, despite Hawk being famous for the kind of movies Jay hated the most. The critic was also an early adopter of the meta-humor cutaway gags, later popularized by series like Family Guy, though here they had a little more context. Movie parodies framed as the imaginary films Jay was tasked with reviewing. This is where a lot of the show's best-remembered jokes came from. <gasps> we left Kevin home alone, and he's only 23! Ah! Listen, Callahan, your partners have a way of dying on you. So I got you a new rookie, fresh from the academy. Hi! Who gets the raw dead goat? That would be me! Excuse me, is this Hanukkah Town? No, it's the Vatican, and I'm Pope Shlomo. Oi. All right, Callahan, I've got some new partners for you. A woman, a cute little kid, an ugly old dog, a dinosaur, and a leprechaun. I'll be your lucky charm. Unfortunately, perhaps because its creators had worked so hard making it so unique, the critic never quite found an audience. Even though the similarly themed Seinfeld was a big hit in the same era, this was still a few years before metropolitan New York had reclaimed its mantle as the natural center of the universe in popular culture. So jokes about Ed Koch, the bizarre business practices of Ted Turner, Jay's Rockefeller Republican parent, or even Jay's own intellectual malaise weren't what a lot of the country was looking for in primetime escapism. Worse still, its own network didn't like it. Gene and Reese were used to the relative creative freedom that Fox had given The Simpsons and are said to have clashed with the executives at family-friendly ABC over the series' racier content. Supposedly, they started getting angry notices in the first episode because Jay wound up sleeping with a woman he'd only met that same morning. Now, son, you may just have noticed there was a beautiful woman in my bed. I won't tell anyone. Actually, I wish you would tell everyone. Though, in the story, she's technically a glamorous actress who's seducing him to try and get a good review for her movie. Yeah, uh, that never happens. Anyway, ABC declined to renew the series after airing only one season, but executives at Fox eagerly picked it up for a second, looking to make it a companion series to The Simpsons, and even setting up The Simpsons' first canonical crossover with another animated series. The crossover was initially objected to by Simpsons creator Matt Groening, though the resulting episode, A Star is Burns, is viewed by many as one of the classics. The show also underwent an overhaul in response to criticisms of the ABC series. Jay's character model got softer and rounder to make him more appealing, and the backgrounds for his apartment, a posh, expensive-looking penthouse in the first 
first season, was made to look more modest to make him more relatable. The biggest change, though, was junking the setup of Jay as a single man, unlucky in love but always trying, in favor of giving him a regular love interest named Alice, who actually was a pretty good character in her own right, even though her function was ultimately to make Jay a little less interesting. I tend to be in the camp of fans who think the first season was overall better, but the second was still damn good. Unfortunately, the series' bad luck on the production side continued. According to Gene and Reese, the Fox executives who wanted the show wound up being replaced by the time it went to air with a new regime that didn't want anything to do with it, and were in no rush to greenlight a third season. There was actually interest in moving the show yet again, this time to UPN, but Fox dragged its feet on an official cancellation for so long that the deal fell apart. That seemed to be the end for Jay Sherman, but then in 2000, The Critic came back one more time as a series of animated short subjects for AdamFilms.com, written again by Gene and Reese. The shorts aren't really great, and the only returning characters are Jay and Vlada the Restaurateur. Alice appears to have left the picture, which ends up robbing Jay of a lot of his Season 2 character development. The show has been syndicated here and there since then, and earned enough of a cult following for a DVD release featuring both seasons and the shorts. I recommend checking it out, if for no other reason than more people will get the references I keep making to it on this show. I'm sitting on top of a volcano of rage and I've got nowhere to direct it. There's a critic screening of the new Sylvester Stallone movie tonight. What's it about? Let's see. He plays a concert pianist too. To the multiplex!